How, how's everybody doing today? Did you all have a good week? Two people had a good week, the rest of you. Well, uh, today we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. If you have your Bible, please turn with me there. We are, we're finishing up our series in 1 Corinthians. Today's our, our last Sunday. Um, you know, I really toiled with the idea of maybe breaking this chapter in two and, and coming back after, um, you know, a week off uh, and, and doing it. But uh, Rod made some snide remarks last week, and, uh, and I just felt like, you know what? Thus saith the Lord, you know. And so when Rod speaks, I just got to listen to the man. And so... Uh, Rod, thank you so much for, for coming up last Sunday and proclaiming God's word and just so proud of you and the work that you're doing and what God is doing through you. You know, uh, we were on vacation and we weren't going to be here last Sunday and we were driving home from Texas and uh, we were trying to decide where we we're going to go to church and, and I, I'm not sure how it was said, but one of our kids said, well, why don't we just go to White Park? You know what I mean? And so, and I, I'm so grateful that, that we go to a church that my kids, they want to come here, you know, and they enjoy being at church and they enjoy uh, the children's ministry and all that they have and their friends and the community that's here. And so, uh, so we were here and uh, really just blessed by Rod's preaching and, um, and just blessed to be here as well. And, you know, uh, Two things I want to just announce to you. Next Sunday is uh, uh, the deacon ordination. And it, that service is going to look a little bit different than our normal services, which is a good thing. Sometimes we need some sort of breakup from the, the, the usual. But I, uh, I, I just want to encourage you to come to this. And I know it's, uh, you, we all have things going on in our life. But if you can make it, make it. Uh, we have, I believe, I, I don't want to say the exact number, but I think it's seven. Uh, is it seven, correct? But I think it's seven deacons that are being ordained next Sunday. What a great opportunity that is uh, for our church to have men and women coming forward saying, I want to serve the local body and uh, to serve you. And so they are committing themselves to this ministry. And I'm just I'm blown away by their commitment and their willingness to serve and their character. And uh, it's going to be a great service. There's going to be cookies and punch following. And, uh, and so I hope that you can make it for that. And then secondly, I just want to, men, we have our men's retreat coming up next month, like three weeks away, September 8th and 9th. It's a stay retreat. So we go to Camp Geiger, then you go home and sleep, and then you come back here on Saturday morning. If you've not signed up for that, please do so, so we can kind of get a an idea of how much food to prepare for that and, and buy and prepare. We're just going to somewhere to buy it, okay? We're not doing it ourselves. And so, uh, so just an FYI there, that'd be very helpful. That being said, let's pray and we'll get started. Lord, we give you thanks for the day. We thank you so much for the many blessings that you've given to us. Lord, I, I, uh, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be at White Park and to worship you today. I thank you for the, the many elements of worship that we've experienced here today. The songs have been sung, the, the gifts that have been given, the prayers that have been lifted up. And Father, just for uh, your presence that's here. God, we know that, that you are an unseen guest with us today. And so, Lord, as we come and we look at your word, I, I pray and I ask that you would speak to us. And that you would allow for us to know your will for our lives Allow for us to know the next step that we are to take in our, in our walk with you. Help us to be discerning and to be willing to listen, our lives open to what you have to say to us. Lord, I, I recognize that I have a part in this. And so, Lord, if you would, forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of the unrighteousness that is in my life. Lord, I, I recognize that, that I need you and that, that I am a sinner. And that the only way that I can stand on this stage behind that desk and preach to the people of God is by your grace. 
And so, Father, I, uh, I ask that you would just allow for these words and for your word to be enough today. That through the preaching of God's word that people would hear and they would respond. Father, if there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. The day where they admit that they are a sinner, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and confess Christ as Savior and Lord. And Father, if, if there's a believer that's here that may be struggling with their faith or maybe going through a hard time or just a period of difficulty or sadness or uncertainty, Maybe they're wearied and tired. Father, I pray that you would fill up their cup and allow for them to know that you are here, that you're with them, and that you will guide them. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you did on the cross. We pray all these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. In the last few weeks, we've spent significant time in chapter 5, and we've looked at uh, the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how his resurrection guarantees the resurrection of his followers. In last week's text, you saw that when Christ returns, we will be resurrected with our new spiritual bodies. In today's passage of Scripture, Paul is concluding this letter. Um, we're going to kind of break this up into three main sections. The first is dealing with an offering. The second is Paul's future plans. And the third is the just instructions to welcome other church leaders. And, and I, uh, again, I could break this up. And I, I don't know if we necessarily need to. He concludes this with like a, a kind of a, a goodbye, a greeting, a goodbye greeting. And so, or, uh, so let's just look at the text. Verse 1. Now, concerning the collection of the, for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you are to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Paul is instructing them to give money to the church in Jerusalem. He tells them to set aside some money every Sunday to give to the church in Jerusalem. This word collection is only used twice in all of Scripture, and it's right here both times. And it's just an, an offering. It's always saying, take up a, an offering. You know, the first fruits of your money, of your, of your, of your salary, take and set that aside for kingdom purposes. Why does Paul tell them to do this, right? I mean, why is he telling them to not just save it here and, and instead of giving it to like the church in Corinth? Why is he saying, hey, give it to the church in Jerusalem? Well, I think some of the things can be said here. One is there's probably an offering that's being collected for the church in Corinth as well, but he's wanting to make sure that they are also collecting an offering for Jerusalem. So let's just make that clear. But I think Beyond that, there are two kind of main reasons. One is because I think, I mean, you think about these churches were meeting in what? Homes. I mean, they didn't have a facility like this. They didn't have a pastor like this. They didn't have staff like we had. They didn't have, you know, overhead like we have. And so the budget they need to be, to run and to be successful and to do the things that God wants them to do was a lot smaller than, say, a church like we have here today or most churches that are that are established in 2023. They were led by lay leaders. They didn't need a big budget. Things were just getting started. They, they didn't even have a pastor. They were, they, uh, some would even say that maybe they don't even need one. I, and I think that's maybe proves, history proves that's not to be the case. But, uh, but just think about this for a moment, right? I mean, I was reading a book this week by Roger Olson, one of our former professors, and he has a book on the history of Christian theology. And one of the things he says about, you know, the history of Christian theology, it didn't start until the apostle John died. And he said, like, Christian theology, I mean, they didn't, like, the church didn't need theology. Like, they, like, when they had a question about God, you know what they did? 
They picked up the phone and they asked Paul. That's what they did. Why, why, I mean, why study theology when you have an apostle right there? Just go ask him. If you have a question, you need some authoritative answers, go ask. And so, I mean, does that make sense? Like, so that Paul is saying, go and give this money to the church so that the work that can be done, like this is like the Jerusalem is their meeting place, right? Their headquarters. I think secondly, and most importantly, Paul wanted them to know that they were a part of something bigger than themselves. He wanted them to understand without a shadow of a doubt that, hey, there is something bigger going on here than just your little church in Corinth. That you are a part of something much bigger than just what's inside of your city walls. It makes sense? Friends, let us not forget that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. This, sometimes we can have a, a small view, I think, of the kingdom of God, tunnel vision. The only thing that we care about, think about, is ourselves. I, one of the things I love about young people, uh, the, the, not just like young people, but the young people today, is they are, I mean, they are, they care about small things and small people. Like, I talked to a young man just here a few weeks back. He said, man, I, I'm really hopeful for the church. I, I'm rooting for the church, is what he said. And I, I want to see the church succeed. I want them to, to do well. But I, he goes, my fear is that the church in America, like, it's just they're concerned only about themselves. And I, I just, I, I wish that the churches, they would con Concern themselves with other people. With the people that are in need. He goes, I, I look at a church's budget and I'm just confused. I mean, sometimes if you look at our budget, I mean, you can, you can be confused. One of the things like I, my... My goal as a, pastor, as a pastor of White Park Baptist Church is that every year that I'm your pastor, we give more money to missions. Friends, I, 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 every year that budget needs to go up. What we're doing outside of these four walls needs to be more and more. It's one of the reasons why we have a, a team in Colorado right now. It's one of the reasons why we have a team going to Ecuador in January. And it's one of the reasons why we'll continue to send men and women across the globe. It's because that's what we're called to do. We're called to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It's not just Wyatt Park Baptist Church. It's not just St. Joe. That's not just our mission field. It's the globe. Go into the nations and make disciples. That's what God has, Jesus Christ has ordered us to do. He's told us go into all the nations. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's our mission field. That's what we're called to be a part of. And so was Corinth. Corinth was called to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And friends, let me tell you, they were falling victim to that old self-centered attitude. Well, all they cared about was themselves. Friends, if we fail to recognize that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, it will become the death of not just this church, but any church that does the same. We give so that others can go and do what we aren't called to and able to go and do. One of the things I love about being a Baptist is our focus on missions our focus on serving others. Paul had a vision. Uh, not, was, Paul had a, a principle that he lived by. 
And he was, a, he was a part of something bigger than himself. It's why he's willing to die for his faith, friends. Because the God that he worshiped and the God that we worshiped is worth dying for. It's worth giving up everything and going. I, 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 maybe, I, maybe I'm crazy to think this way. Maybe I'm just naive, but I, I still believe that God is in the business of calling men and women just like you to quit your jobs and go to the mission field. It's not outside the possibility, friends, that God might be speaking to you right now to say, go, quit your job and leave. Verse 5, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intended to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on the journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a, a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as am I, so let no one despise him, help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me. For I'm expecting him with the other brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not a at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. The reason Paul included this in his letter, in this letter, um, was his travel plans had changed, okay? Uh, we would see that in Second Corinthians chapter 1 that some thought that he was going to visit them before he visited Macedonia. That he was going to take a, a boat from Ephesus to Corinth and then travel from, Eph from Corinth to Macedonia by land. But he decided, he says in this passage of Scripture, hey, the opportunity for me to stay here has presented itself to do good work. And there's adversaries here, and so I, the, it's a priority for me to stay here. Like, I, I need to stay in Ephesus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse my plans. I'm going to I'm going to go from Ephesus to Macedonia, and then from Macedonia, I'm going to come to you. And when I come, I don't want to just be here for a moment. I want to stay with you for an extended period of time. They didn't like this, uh, as we see in 2 Corinthians. Uh, they, they, they thought he was kind of wishy-washy, flipping, flopping. You know, they... Flip-flop Paul is what they call him in the underworld. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I watched too many cartoons. I'm sorry. Uh, but they, they, they said, hey, if you, if you can't trust this man's word, if you cannot trust him, on simple things like his travel plans, then can you trust him? with his theology? Can you trust him with his teachings? He's not a man of his word. He's not a man of character. If he was, he would have said, he would have done what he said he was going to do, but he didn't. And so, they're and so I mean, Paul is just explaining to them, hey, my, my plans have changed for good reason. Act accordingly. Just, just making you aware. This didn't sit well with them. And friends, let me tell you something. There are going to be people in your life, and you're going to you know, I mean, Paul wasn't perfect, right? I mean, he wasn't doing this for the wrong reasons. He did it because of the right reasons. And sometimes we do things for the right reasons, and that kind of maybe makes people not happy because it affects their life. You do something, it's like, hey, I got to do this. It's the right thing to do. I know we had plans, but I need to do this. And some people would look at that situation, and they will just, they're looking for a reason, friends, to be upset with you. You're doing everything that God has told you to do. You're doing the right thing. You're being the, you have the right character, the right motives, the right intentions, and they don't care. There are people like that that's gonna, in, 
in your lives. I know we all have individuals that no matter what you do, uh huh, mm hmm. Marshall Shelley calls them in his book, Well Intentioned Dragons. They, they, they mean well, right? I mean, these people, these people like the church in Corinth, they, they might have good intentions, but they are, what? Undermining everything that you do. You make a decision, whew, and they undermine. Cause all kinds of problems for Paul. They question his leadership. They question his character. I, I think it's hard to fault Paul in this situation, right? I mean, all he's doing is saying, hey, I, I, I need to be here. It's, I don't want to leave here and have to come back. Let me deal with this situation now, this fire that has come up. Let me put it out. Let me handle this matter. Let me handle this situation. Not a reason to question his character. Not a reason to question his teaching. But rather just a simple, okay, I understand. But it shows the character of the church. If you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, them questioning Paul's character because it shows their true colors. It shows where they are at. I mean, all Paul is doing is saying, hey, I'm going to make a decision to stay here, change my plans. I'm still going to be here. It's going to be a little bit later. And not only does he do that, but look what he does. He sends his very best, number two, right? Timothy. I'm going to send Timothy. When he comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the, the work of the Lord as I am. Let no one despise him, help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. I mean, he's like, hey, I'm going to send you the very best God that I have to be with you. Not that Paul doesn't want to be there, but rather just the opposite. He wants to be there, but he can't leave the current situation. Verse 13. Be watchful, he says. Some final instructions, this third part here. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men and be strong. That all that you, that all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they devoted themselves to the service of the saints and, and be subject to such as these. And to every follow, fellow worker and laborer, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fort Unatus and Achaicus, Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refresh my spirit as well as yours, and give recognition to such people. Paul's last instructions to this church in this letter was to do what? Stand firm, act like men, be strong, and let everything that you do be done in what? Love. Essentially, Paul is telling them, hey, stay awake. Be aware that there are, there are, there are people around you that are they're going to try to get you to stray away from the truth. And all Paul is saying, hey, just be cautious. Stay strong. <laughs> Act like a man. <laughs> Can't say that today. That's what Paul said. Stand firm in your faith. Don't allow for a false doctrine to overcome what I've taught you. The church in Corinth struggled with being led astray, false doctrines, things like Gnosticism, and Paul didn't want them to go down that road. He cared about these people, friends. I mean, it's, Paul genuinely cared for these men and women of faith in Corinth. 
It's why he sent Timothy. It's why he's going back. And listen to this. I mean, when he says this, this Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, like these, are, these are men from Corinth. Okay, these, these three guys are, are and they're converts. And they, they come and they deliver letters to Paul and Ephesus. And Paul sees these people and he cares for them. And it's like all these emotions and feelings for these men and for this church. He cares. As I said earlier, I was, we were in Texas last week and uh, we just planned a, a vacation there around Memorial Day. We were going to go somewhere else and decided to go down there. And uh, we went down to the, the Gulf at, to like Port Orange, this area. It's a really nice uh, spot and just uh, never been and reserved a hotel. And my, uh, my sister works for Marriott. And so we were able to get a discount through Marriott, and we just found a cheap room, and bam. And little did we know that uh, some of our, our really good friends in Texas, they're, they have a family home in the same town. And so when we were down there, we were for a couple of days, like two days, we were able to see these friends of ours. And they were members of the church that, I, that Kathy and I were at when we were in seminary. And... Uh, you know, like I just, they are as close to family as any family that's not blood related is. And they have been just such a, a wonderful family for us. And, uh, and we've just generally just, we love those people. And they love us. And they've, I mean, it's just a great, whenever we're together, we just have a great time. And I, I just think about like when I was, when we were down there, I just, and you know, you have 14 hour drive back and you just have like a, you know, you, you think of, about your church down there and, and like, it was all good things, you know, good memories. Uh, you know, like I, whenever I'm back at home, like I, I want to go to my, the church that I was raised in, or I want to go to the church that Kathy and I went to when we were in college or like I, like, I miss the church that I pastored there in Indiana or the two that I was at. Like, I, I'm not there anymore, but I love those people, you know? There's no hard feelings. There's no animosity. Like, I miss those people. I truly do. And at the same time, like, I'm fully invested, fully I'm here, and I, and I love all of you. And one of these days, hopefully a long time from today, I'm going to leave this church. And, and the reality is when that day happens, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss all of you. And Paul, I mean, just because he was somewhere else, it doesn't mean that he, he doesn't love these folks. And just because he had a, a, is dealing with some difficulty in this situation doesn't mean that he doesn't love them and care for them. And when he sees these other, these three men, man, it's like all these emotions. Man, like, what does he say? And made up for your absence. And Paul loved these folks. And he cared for their soul. He started this church. He desired to see them grow and to, to flourish and to do well. And he wanted that. He didn't want them to be led astray. He wanted them to be faithful, to be courageous, to stand firm in their faith. Last few verses of this book. The churches of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, and they send you hearty greetings in the Lord. And all the brothers send you greetings and to greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write these things with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord come. The grace 
of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus, amen. Paul wanted these men and women to be the people that God had called them to be. He wanted them to, to be faithful, to be strong in their faith, to be courageous in their faith, and to love other believers. I mean, the greatest commandments, friends, are really, it's, it's, we all know it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And, and the, same, the second one is like it. To love your neighbor. And that's what Paul is saying here to these people. Hey, that's my desire for you, is to love the, is for you to love the Lord and to love your neighbor. It's quite simple instructions. And yet, as we see with this church, it's easier said than done. And maybe that's what you're recognizing today in your own life. That, hey, this is pretty simple, but I've kind of made a mess of this whole situation. You know, loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength is easier said than done. Loving your neighbor is, is easy until it's not. And then it becomes kind of hard. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on in your life right now. And I would love to be able to sit down this week and, and hear your story and drink a cup of coffee with you. Know a little bit more about your struggles, your hardship. Maybe what the Lord is teaching you. Maybe where he's calling you to go or what he's calling you to do. I, I would love that opportunity. I truly would. Maybe God is calling you to do something today. Not to wait till later this week, but right here, right now. Maybe he's saying to you, I need to make a decision. You need to make a decision. To put your faith and trust in Jesus. To admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and confess Christ as Savior and Lord. Maybe you need to say, hey, I, I need to get more involved. I need to take a, a deeper step in my walk. I need to grow closer to the Lord. I need to forgive my brother. I need to forgive my sister. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and I'm going to allow for you to have an opportunity to, to respond as the Lord is leading you. I don't know how that is, but this altar is here for you. If you want to come forward and, and pray, you can do that. If you want to come into the back and the welcome center, I'll be there, and I would love to pray for you. But I, I just want to encourage you, friends, to take the opportunity that we have as we conclude this book to look inwardly at your life and ask yourself, am I standing firm? Am I being strong in my faith? Am I being courageous? Am I, am I being obedient? Am I loving my neighbor? Am I all in? And as the Lord speaks, would you respond? Would you listen? Father God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this place. Father, I, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us now. And as you speak, Lord, help us to listen. Help us to hear and help us to respond. And give us the grace that we need today to respond in a way that will bring you honor and glory. Lord Jesus, we love you. Pray all these things in your name. And all God's people said,